Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webinar in the Lancaster Sociology Big Questions webinar series. Today, I'm delighted to have Professor Imogen Tyler with me. Uh, my name is Dr. Allison Hoy, and I'll be chairing the event. Imogen is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and has made significant contributions to research on inequalities for many years now. Um, her 2013 book, Revolting Subjects, um, was shortlisted for the Bread and Roses Award for Radical Publishing and the BSA Philip Abrams Memorial Pro Prize. And stigma has also long been a focus of her work from um, a 2008 article uh, entitled Chav Mum, Chav Scum um, to uh, her sociological review monograph um, that was uh, done in uh, 2018 to then her project uh, that this book comes out of, which was developed during a Philip Leverhulme Prize research project. And so Imogen, I think, is probably going to have a vast number of intriguing things to tell us about today, and we're absolutely delighted to have her here. Imogen, over to you. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here speaking to you all virtually uh, today, and thanks, Alison, for organising this talk and this series from the Sociology Department at Lancaster. So the big question I've been set to answer today is how does stigma contribute to social inequalities? This question is at the heart of my new book that you can see on the screen, Stigma, the Machinery of Inequality. And as the title suggests, this book is concerned about thinking about the role or function of stigma as part of what I term the machinery of inequality, the mechanisms, levers, pulleys, which reproduce social inequalities and social hierarchies. So it's concerned this project with thinking about the role that the stigmatization of specific groups of people plays in reproducing social inequalities of poverty, class, race, disability, health, wealth, inequalities relating to citizenship, borders, and more. So in order to examine how stigma functions in the reproduction of inequalities, in the book, what I do is rethink and rework the concept of stigma itself. And I do this by drawing on long histories and lineages, lineages of stigma, examining how stigma has operated and continues to operate in multiple contexts and places as an oppressive form of power. So this research is about what it means to think about stigma as a form or a practice of power, which centers on the devaluation and the dehumanization of human lives. So we need to begin here with understanding how stigma functions as an apparatus of power before we can garner effective forms of resistance to it. So when I was thinking about the focus for this particular talk today, I was a bit torn about how to illustrate the reworking of the concept of stigma, which I undertake in my book. So I thought about beginning with the political programme of Austerity Britain, to illustrate how state welfare has been enabled by what I term stigma politics. And of course, we're seeing the extended impacts of this in the wake of the current pandemic. And the book actually begins in austerity Britain, and there's a big chapter dedicated to thinking about what I call the stigma machine of austerity. I also considered beginning with stigma, borders, racism and citizen, citizenship regimes and the ways in which racism, which is a primary, if not the primary form of social stigma, functions to produce a hostile environment for asylum seekers, refugees, migrants. And as we're currently seeing in the UK with political media and public responses to refugee boats crossing the English Channel. And as to how the stigmatization of migrants and refugees contributes to the kinds of pushback policies we're seeing across Europe at the moment and, and elsewhere in the world. We can return to these and other topics in the questions, but I actually decided it might be most helpful to focus this talk on the concept of stigma itself. Because in order to approach the question, how does stigma contribute to social inequalities or reproduce them? I think we need to begin with the meaning of stigma. That is, that is with what the word and concept of stigma denotes. 
and how practices of stigmatisation have always been rooted in social and economic systems of government which seek to dehumanise the other. In the foreword to the 2016-17 Amnesty International report on the state of the world's human rights, the Secretary General um, Shetty warned us that we are witnessing a global trend towards what he could describe as an angrier and more divisive politics in which the idea of human dignity is under vigorous and relentless assault from powerful narratives of blame, fear and scapegoating propagated by those who seek to take or cling on to power. Across the world, Shetty writes, leaders and politicians wager their future power on narratives of fear and disunity, pinning blame on the other for the real or manufactured grievances of the electorate. So the thesis of this stigma book and this project is that in order to counter this vigorous and relentless assault upon human dignity that's a major characteristic of the current global authoritarian turn, we require better understanding of how stigma is propagated as a governmental technology of division and dehumanisation. We need to track the role played by stigma politics in producing the toxic climate of fear and hatred that is enveloping and dividing so many societies, societies and communities. We need to examine how stigma power is crafted and cultivated as a means of levering political capital. We need a better understanding also of how this divisive politics gets under the skin of those whom it subjugates. That is how state and media cultivated stigma changes the ways in which people think about themselves and others, corroding compassion, crushing hope, weakening social solidarity. So stigma seeks to enrich sociological understandings of stigma as a concept, as an idea, as a material force and a practice. And it hopes also to enliven wider public debates about what stigma is, but particularly where stigma comes from, how and by whom it's produced and for what purposes. So it's concerned with what lo a lot of social scientific accounts, but not all, um, accounts of stigma frequently neglect. Namely, an understanding of stigma is embedded within the social relations of capitalism and as a form of power which is entangled with histories of capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy. So my work attempts stretches really the frameworks in which we ordinarily think about stigma and it aims in doing that to also dislodge stigma from the settled meanings it's acquired within 20th, 20th century social sciences and to disrupt the more individualistic, the more ahistorical and politically anaesthetised conceptualisations of stigma we've inherited from this tradition. So what is stigma? What does stigma mean? The philosopher Ian Hacking reminds us that all concepts have what he calls their being in historical sites. What then is the historical being of stigma? It's useful to return to the etymology of this word to discover how the meaning of stigma has evolved over time. There are different words for stigma in different languages. Many have the same etymological roots and I'm going to focus on the English word stigma. So this is how the Oxford English Dictionary defines stigma as a noun that means a distinguishing mark or characteristic of a bad or objectionable kind or a mark of disgrace or infamy, a sign of severe censure or condemnation it regarded as, it's in, regarded as impressed on a personal thing. I'm going to begin with these two and then going to return to the third definition here. Everyday uses of the word stigma draw on both of these definitions of stigma as a mark. So stigma describes the degrading marks that are fixed to particular bodies, people, conditions and places often within humiliating social interactions, but also in other representational practices. 
1816, George Crabbe defines stigma as follows. It's what falls upon a person in the judgment of others. It's the black mark which is set upon a person by the public and is consequently the strongest of all marks, which everyone most dreads and every good man seeks least to observe. These marks might be metaphorical, as in a judgment made about somebody's character, but also might be still more literal, as for example in early welfare practices in England, such as badging the poor, making people in receipt of relief wear a badge on their clothing in public. Fallen women uh, were often made to wear special distinguishing marks on their clothes, as in uh, the famous Nathaniel Hawthorne story illustrated here. Um, but also we can think about practices, stigma practices, such as unwed mothers um, being made to wear the colour yellow in the in 19th century workhouses. These dictionary definitions of stigma were composed by lexicographers uh, at the Oxford English Dictionary in about 1916, and they don't reflect the way in which the word acquired an increasingly psychological or psychosocial meaning from the mid 20th century onwards. So when we use the term stigma today or people use it when we talk to them or interview them, um, we still use it to describe practices of being marked out, being judged or classified by others. But we also tend to use it in relationship to people's experience to invoke the psychological effects of being stigmatised, often with a particular emphasis on how the shame induced by being stigmatised corrodes our sense of well-being or damages our sense of um, self in some way. And it's helpful, I think, to differentiate between stigma and shame a little bit. So these are terms which overlap in their usage, but shame is an emotion which describes the feelings which may or may not be triggered by being stigmatised. While stigma, um, and I want to hold on to this, um, this difference, stigma describes the practices of marking out or the mark made. So in order to examine the relationship between stigma and inequality, I wanted to stay with this kind of original meaning of stigma and think about this marking out function of stigma. And because uh, it allows us to focus on who is doing the stigmatizing, how stigma is being produced, from where, by whom and for what purpose. So the shifts to psychology um, can detract or draw our attention away from questions of power. So to stay with stigma as marking is useful and I want to dig back a little bit more into the history of this term. So the English word stigma originates from a clutch of ancient Greek words derived from the root word stig meaning to prick or to puncture. The verb stizo was used to describe ink tattooing with needles or other sharp implements upon human skin and stigma described the resulting mark. So it, a stigma was a tattoo. You can read more about this in my book, but what we discover if we research this is that in ancient Greece and later Roman Empire, a stigma was an, ink, uh, an involuntary ink tattoo pricked into the human skin for penal and property purposes. Greek and the later Roman empires in Europe, um, and they stretched of course beyond what we call Europe today, were both slave economies. And the first recorded use of the word stigma appears in a fragment of 6th century BC poetry where the word stigmatus is used to describe a marked slave. And slaves are henceforth regularly referred to with words such as literati, or, which means lettered, um, or inscripti, which means inscribed, or grepto, which means written upon. So in the Greco-Roman world, penal tattooing was a punishment reserved exclusively for non-citizens, slaves, indentured labourers, prisoners of war, other resident aliens or religious minorities. As Plato wrote in, in the laws, a dialogue on the ethics of government, if anyone is caught committing sacrilege, be he a slave or a stranger, let his offence be written on his face and his hands. This penal tattooing involved the inscription of words, symbols and sometimes full sentences into the skin. 
these tattoos usually consisted of the name of a crime inked into the face. So a common stigma would be something like thief or stop me, I'm a, I'm a runaway tattooed on the forehead. If you survive the torture of being tattooed without antiseptic, antiseptic, you would never be free of the stigma. The disgrace, humiliation and exclusion remain written on your face for all to see. As Mark Gufterson reflects, the effects of a penal tattoo forcibly applied to the face must have been deep, deeply felt, devastating even. Certainly a tattoo on the face would have been difficult to conceal. The gaze of the on, on, onlooker virtually inescapable. There was little defence against it. So penal stigmatisation was intentionally visible, a public form of inscription designed to humiliate and shame. And we can find lots of examples um, of writing about this. The Greek philosopher Bion described how his father had, in place of his face, a document on his face, the mark of his master's harshness. So this bodily inscription, this punishing form of bodily inscription turned, as one Roman emperor put it, turned the stigmatised person into the image of his own penalty. It was particularly associated with people's attempts to escape enslavement and was often a record in effect of an escape attempt. So in some cases, slaves who previously tried to escape would be collared rather than tattooed. And these collars would be iron or of a metal neck rings, which would have been riveted in place and the inscriptions on, on them providing the owner's name, status, occupation and the address to which the enslaved person should be returned. Several Roman slave collars have been found in funerary contexts, which suggests that at least for some, this stigma, this metal neck collar was permanent and would stay on you for life. Um, this surviving collar, you can see here, um, the Zenonia, Zen, Zen, I've never said this word out loud, Zonius collar, um, reads, I have run away, hold me, when you've brought me back to my master, Zonius, you will receive a gold coin. So in summary, and there's much more to say about this, but stigma was an ancient Greek word. It was originated to describe forced tattooing, words, marks and images etched into your skin against your will. It was designed to permanently lower your social status and curtail your mobility. In a world before identity cards, passports, fingerprinting, biometric forms of marking, this penal tattooing was an important technology of identification, surveillance and social control, innovated and expanded to aid, to aid colonial um, expansion. Seeing the tattooed faces of enslaved people and indentured labourers doubtly functioned as a terrorising warning to others, assisting perhaps with the task of imposing order on the variously dispossessed and disenfranchised multi-ethnic classes of slaves and non-citizens who lived within these vast territories uh, of these ancient empires and quelling perhaps the freedom dreams of conquered and subjugated peoples. So stigma was from the very beginning an important form of political publicity. It was so entrenched to practice uh, in antiquity that it began to be used also metaphorically as a, as a term of disgrace. So people, you know, orators would attack each other for slander uh, by um, a famously uh, one Greek orator attacked Plato by saying you've never tattooed any of your slaves, but you've as good as tattooed the most honoured of the Greeks. So we start to get this slippage between um, stigma as a kind of material practice of punishment and stigma kind of used metaphorically uh, as a term to describe uh, disgrace. And I think this slippage, we start to see the modern understanding of stigma begin to emerge as a symbolic mark um, of disgrace. So let's return to the dictionary definition. So 
That third definition defines stigma as the mark made upon the skin by burning with a hot iron as a token of infamy or subjection. This literal definition emphasizes stigma as a material practice of bodily marking and subordination. So it's difficult for us to imagine, as we've just heard, activities that involve burning somebody with a hot iron or cutting or pricking, pricking their skin against their will as actions that aren't saturated with power. And to illustrate this definition, the Oxford English Dictionary includes a phrase penned by the 19th century London Times journalist William Howard. Um, and he's describing advertisements he's seeing in North America during the Civil War for runaway slaves, the description of the stigmata on their persons, whippings and branding, scars and cuts. So this use of stigmata to describe the marks left by the torture on the skin of runaway slaves in 19th century now, we've come a long way from antiquity furnishes stigma with a vicious and bloody meaning and binds the etymology of the word stigma to the 400 year history of chattel slavery in British colonies. The legal right of people to own human beings as goods and chattel was first established by English colonists in the Barbados Slave Code. And this act said that if a slave shall offer any violence to any Christian, he shall be severely whipped, his nose slit and be burned in some part of his face with a hot iron. Um, and being brutish slaves, they deserve not for the baseness of their condition to be tried by legal trial of 12 men of their peers as the subjects of England are. So it seems likely um, that there isn't a coincidence that the hot iron appears again here. Um, that the Oxford English Dictionary definition of stigma as a mark made upon the skin by burning with a hot iron derives in part from these 17th century codes. So lots of histories of stigma start to unfurl from this etymology, histories of torture and slave labour, but also histories of British citizenship for legalising torture in the colonies against enslaved peoples. What the slaves codes legislated is that chattel slaves and their descendants were not citizens. Uh, indeed, they were not considered human at all. So in legal terms, this becomes the foundation um, of the legislative codes that are then used um, across, for example, the US. In black Reconstruction in America, um, written in 1935. Du Bois, the sociologist Du Bois, described the Atlantic slave trade as the transportation of 10 million human beings out of the dark beauty of their mother continent into the newfound El Dorado of the West. They descended into hell. From the beginning of this trade in the 15th, 16th centuries, Europeans took control over enslaved people by branding them, burning symbols of European ownership into the flesh, permanently stigmatising them as chattel, as goods, as property. And we can see here uh, in this letter um, written by the king of the then African Congo um, kingdom to the, ki the then king of Portugal, asking him to cease the trade and describing how his black free subjects were being kidnapped en masse. As soon as they're in the hands of white men, they are branded, he writes, with a red hot iron. Once stigmatised, people were stored in prison hulks, barracoons, factories on the coast of West Africa before being shipped across the Atlantic. Those who survived the terrors of this factory complex and the death ships of the Middle Passage often further branded or tattooed when they're auctioned in the Caribbean and North American slave markets. Violent stigmatization continued in the psychopathic plantation regimes in the Americas, where the technology of the whip was employed, as Edward Baptiste writes, to turn sweat, blood and flesh into gold. So let's think then about what this violent history 
this, 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 this other history of stigma tells us, or this literal definition tells us about the meaning of this word. This is an advert um, for a runaway um, enslaved woman um, that was published in a London newspaper, the Gazette, um, in the mid 18th century, the height of British involvement in the Atlantic trade. It's one of 800 similar adverts published uh, that have been collected in the Runaway Slaves in Britain database recently. And when we read the descriptions of runaways like here, um, this young woman called Sabina, branded with two letters on her breast and shoulder, we can also begin to ascertain how stigma marks function as visual forms of identification, which are technologies of surveillance and mechanisms of capture. We can also start to see how there's a kind of stigma gaze that these advert, these types of adverts seek to inculcate in the public they address. So the readers of the 18th century London newspaper are being solicited to search for identi identifying stigmata on the bodies of those they encounter and are enc being encouraged with inducement of financial rewards to appreh apprehend and return lost property. So stigma is not metaphorical in these examples. These are marks that by, uh, have quite literally been impressed upon people. As Simone Brown argues, branding was a measure of slavery, an act of making the body uh, legible as property that was put to work in the production of the slave as object that could be bought, sold and traded. The violence of stigmatisation is part of the work of the commodification of producing slaves. An example of the branding irons used in barracoons and plantations can be seen at place, uh, can be places such as Liverpool's International Museum of Slavery today, while the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has in its collection this photograph of a freed enslaved man called Wilson Chin, who's branded on his forehead with the, with the letter VBM, the initials of his owner, a sugar planter. This stigma archive reminds us of the ways in which the catastrophe of slavery was quite literally written on the skin, with this stigmata transforming human beings into property, into commodities. Situating stigma, the concept of stigma within the historical, the historical scenography of slavery in the ancient world, and then much, much more recently in chattel slavery, and the colonial world of plantation labour foregrounds, I think, the violence within the more passive conceptualisation stigma we've inherited in 20th century social sciences. It binds stigma to practices of bodily marking and emphasises the role of stigmatisation in systems of social discipline and punishment. It links stigma also to struggles between labour and capital, and to racialize social systems of classifying the differential value of human lives. Of course, when we use the term stigma today, we don't tend to use it to mean the literal acts of inscription um, that I've been highlighting. But in supplementing the meaning of stigma with this other etymology, um, I think is helpful. It's asking you to think about stigma from a strange perspective. So we already likely associate stigma with suffering and cruelty. We know from a vast contemporary social scientific literature that stigma or being stigmatised has devastating effects on people's health and well-being. <coughs> we might even imagine stigma as a form of subjection, which is socially embroidered, pressed and needled upon people through hurtful words or degrading looks or humiliating social interactions. But we don't ordinarily associate stigma with physical violence or use it to describe physical wounds or scars or relate it to the branding iron or associate it with the whipping machines of plantation labour. If we imagine stigma as a form of violence at all, we tend to think of it as a more nuanced form of persecution. 
So, for example, in 1970, the sociologist Robert Pinker argued that what distinguishes stigma from other forms of violence is that it's often slow and unobtrusive. He describes it as a highly sophisticated form of violence, which can at best be compared to those forms of psychological torture in which the victim is broken psychically and physically, but left to all outward appearances unmarked. I think Pinker is correct, partly. In liberal democratic societies, the violence of stigma is often symbolic, diffuse, slow and indirect, but not always. So in my book, what I argue is that we need to recouple the concept of stigma to economic, to materialist histories of bodily marking, because this deepens our understanding of the social, political and function of stigmatisation today. In fact, I would argue that of all the source materials drawn upon by um, those working um, to build the Oxford English Dictionary, the use of the term stigmata described the marks on the bodies of runaway um, shuttle slaves is actually the most instructive for understanding the historical being of this concept because it emphasises the ways in which stigma is always already bound to the voraciousness of capital, the capitalisation of human misery and the profits of immiseration. So as you'll discover, if you read my book, we can't disentangle stigma power from histories of slavery, colonialism, empire, capitalism, the history of enclosures, the industrial revolution, and the formation of the liberal democratic state. The history of stigma, to adapt a phrase from Karl Marx, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. Let's just consider some more recent examples of stigma as a material practice of marking out the other. In order to distinguish its racial enemies in the mid 20th century, the Nazi regime in Europe introduced laws that forced Jews famously, but also others groups um, who were designated enemies of the Aryan state to wear distinguishing badges, most often a yellow star uh, in public places. At labour and extermination camps, elaborate systems of badging were developed to distinguish different classes of prisoners, political prisoners, gypsies, homosexuals, people with disabilities. Those designated for slave labour at the camps rather than immediate death were often stamped with ink signs on their forehead initially and labour numbers were also frequently inked on their skin. And most famously at the Auschwitz complex, this stigmatisation extended to the ink tattooing of serial numbers on Jewish inmates who'd been selected for work. The first experiments in tattooing used a metal stamp which perforated the skin normally on the uh, on the left breast and ink was rubbed into the wound likely a very similar to the technology that was used in ancient greece to tattoo enslaved people this developed into a more sophisticated system of needle tattooing on the left arm the czech holocaust survivor ruth ellis recalls how she survived near starvation in the jewish ghetto a uh, farinstadt near prague but it was only when she lined up to be tattooed at Auschwitz that she understood that she was no longer considered a human being. The numbers on our forearms marked, she said, our depersonalisation. As Primo Levi describes in This Is A Man, the replacement of your name with a tattooed number was your initiation to a great machine which sought to reduce us to beasts. Bauman terms this categorical murder, a process through which the concrete individual is erased and people are made into an abstraction. The abstraction of people into things through stigmatising classifications underpin the operations of the entire Nazi fascist machine. Indeed, it was the culmination of practices of dehumanisation which enabled the stigma machine of Nazi era slave labour camps to be transformed into gigantic death machines. <laughs>
So stigma, I'm arguing, is part of the technology um, of that period of um, fascism in Europe. These penal technologies of dehumanisation were actually prefigured in legal debates amongst scholars. So, for example, in, in Germany in the 30s. So, for example, um, George Darm proposed the reintroduction of shame sanctions as part of the establishment of a new authoritarian legal system. His basic argument was that liberty is the highest order, uh, highest good of an old, the old liberal order, an honour should be the highest good of the new Nazi order. So shame sanctions, um, which deprive offenders of honour, should be um, the Nazi punishment of choice. In short, he and other uh, Nazi uh, fascists, uh, legal uh, actors, call for a redesign of the German, German judicial systems to support the implementation of a new illiberal racial order uh, within um, Germany and its increasing uh, colonies within Europe. So Darm's proposal for an overhaul of the German legal system weren't implemented uh, in full, but were already being kind of introduced um, from below by paramilitary arms of the Nazi party. So we start to see these public humiliation and shaming practices rolled out. Um, and this image here of Jewish women in Austria um, during uh, the, the um, Knights of Kristallnacht, who'd been who were being exhibited in public, uh, would be characteristic of these practices that start emerging across uh, Nazi Europe. The use of stigma punishments was accompanied um, for the Nazis by a massive state propaganda campaign, primarily primarily targeting Jews, but also of in individuals and groups designated as racial or political enemies of the state. This pro this Nazification movement included poster campaigns, anti-Semitic newspapers, films, radio broadcasts, degenerate art exhibitions. Uh, most famously an anti-Semitic Eternal Jew exhibition, which opened in Germany, Munich, and then toured um, in Vienna, Berlin, and elsewhere that consisted of hundreds of artworks, photographs, and objects designed to represent and educate the public in the subhumanity of the Jews. This touring exhibition was accompanied by a catalog, a lecture series, and theater performances. Um, this film poster here um, for a kind of pseudo documentary film that was made in 1940, The Eternal Jew, was one of a collection of fascist films which was um, toured across Germany, Germany and later in, screened in occupied cities and towns across Europe. And Nazi police reports note a correlation in anti-Semitic feeling, street harassment and violence in the wake of these film screenings and, and other events. In fact, this film was um, became used, was shown to police and SS units, uh, particularly was screened to guards at concentration extermination camps, since it thought that screening this film would ward off any scruples people might feel about the merciless persecution and annihilation of Jewish people. So these state, the state funded huge operation of cultural stigma production was the prelude to mass dehumanization and of course the geno genocidal violence. Okay, so one argument is that um, most famously made by Michel Foucault was that what we see in the 18th century is the introduction of more subtle punishments in society. And in place of imprisonment and physical torture, we start to have this shift away from um, the spectacle of the symbolically branded body and the spectacle of torture in public. And we can see, and there's historical evidence that supports this argument in terms of social discipline and punishment within Europe. However, one of the arguments I make in the book that this idea that the body is a major target of penal repression disappears 
is significantly overstated. The spectacle of the scaffold, as Foucault calls it, doesn't vanish. It's more that it's outsourced across European uh, empires, um, across the colonies, spreading its kind of practices, penal practices around the world. Public spectacles of violence blow back into Europe with the rise of fascism and a new European dawn of public spectacles of violence is inaugurated. And this continues after the Second World War, uh, where we start to see um, backlashes against Nazi collaborators, the shaming punishments, for example, meted out to women who were alleged to have slept with German soldiers. In France alone, around 2000 women are thought to have been subject to these public humiliations head shaving, face marking, uh, being stripped, spat, jeered at, being paraded through the streets in ways which, which very much echo early, sent earlier centuries of the kind of scolding and parading of women. So one of the arguments I'm trying to make by taking you on this journey across lots of different parts of history is to argue that, that there's a periodic intensification of judicial and wider social and cultural practices of public stigmatisation and shaming practices. And we need to approach these phenomena not as the appearance of something new, but the reappearance of something very old. So this is about repetition and it's about not understanding um, history as, as a progressive, but understanding what these re eruptions of stigmatisation tell us. A much more recent example is the shame sanctions, as they're called, that have been reintroduced from the 90s in the US, but also elsewhere, which is this sort of mass proliferation of legal shaming sanctions as part of a regime of alternative sanctions, which in the words of one US judge are used to inflict disgrace in a dramatic and spectacular manner. These stigma penalties are widely employed now by US federal judges in lieu of prison sentences. Um, and here's, this is just one example. You can read about more of, about this um, in the book. But of course, we can see this public stigma or these, this intensification of stigma practices much in a much broader context in terms of media culture. And there's lots of interesting media scholarship on the way in which, for example, um, forms such as genres such as reality TV, but also digital and online spaces, we can understand of as part of this kind of stigma production uh, within kind of mass media culture, which are also, of course, surveillant. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. When we use the term stigma today, we don't tend to think of it in terms of the, the examples that I've just been talking about today to mean these kind of literal acts of inscription and marking out. So in supplementing the meaning of stigma with this other etymology, um, the point is to try and add depth and historical richness to that concept. Um, to recouple the concept of stigma, in particular to economic and materialist histories of bodily marking, to foreground the kind of violence within the more passive conceptualizations of stigma we've inherited from the 20th century social science. And I think what I'm particularly concerned about or what this enables us to do in doing this is it makes us focus on looking up looking up to where stigmas being produced from and by whom to govern populations on multiple scales um, and thinking about stigma as a, a forms of production uh, that are being crafted and activated stigma doesn't just come from anywhere as it as it, it cascades into our in everyday interactions from somewhere the other thing I'm really interested in uh, and concerned with is looking back, as I've done a little bit today. So looking back to what I call family trees of stigma and thinking about how stigma um, very often isn't new, but is it's reactivated along historical lines. Um, so we see the state sanctioned stigma, 
um, strategies, reactivating, you know, very familiar tropes or stigmatized figures continuously. So in order to understand the intensification of stigma power that's happening at the moment, we need to both look up, but we also have to look back. So to conclude, before I take some questions, so this, this GIF that I made with an artist uh, called Tom Morris kind of tries to illustrate or put into GIF form how I kind of um, think about stigma as a concept, uh, as a kind of um, historical concept, but also as a concept that's about pressing power um, to extract wealth, a kind of extractive, the way in which stigma is entangled with extractive systems of capitalism. Um, so to end with, I think I would just say that we have to theorise stigma as a form of power that's embedded within political economies, that it functions to devalue entire groups of people with the purpose of fortifying existing social hierarchies and creating very often to create new opportunities for extraction of value or capital and the redistribution of wealth at the moment, um, redistribution of wealth upwards. So I'm going to finish on that point, but I hope at least I've begun to answer the question about why reconceptualizing stigma as power can assist us and help us in seeing how stigma reproduces social inequalities. Thanks. Thank you so much, Imogen. That was really interesting. And um, we do have time for a few questions. If anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat area and we'll get to as many as we can. And the first question, uh, there's actually two questions. I think both relate, Imogen, to this issue of how people who have been stigmatized respond and how we need to take that into account. So one is commenting on the way that stigmata have been reclaimed, for example, um, in medieval Christianity. And the yeah. other, um, I'm going to read aloud for you because I think it, it's, it's it, and there are certain assumptions in there that I think I'll just express so you can respond to. So this question is, um, if we separate the non-physical act of stigmatization from the emotion of shame, does it mean that if someone who is targeted is able to refuse to be or feel shamed, then that stigmatization has failed? Yeah. So that's a really good question. So the reason, I, and, and it's difficult to disentangle stigma and shame, uh, particularly because they're used interchangeably. But the reason I kind of try and hold them apart is precisely because you may be stigmatised and someone may want to make you ashamed, but stigmatisation doesn't always work. It may fail. And in, um, so, so the failure is important as is resistance. So I haven't got on to, I knew it'd be asked about resistance because the book's full of resistance and resistance practices. And I haven't managed to cover that in the talk today, but I precisely want to emphasize that stigmatization doesn't always work, that you can, so even in ancient uh, Greece, there's accounts of how people who've been tattooed um, given a penal tattoo, I've, I've then got somebody else to rework that tattoo into a flower or bird, just like people do today when they they tattoo over their old tattoo of their old boyfriend's name and change it into something else. That or recipes for removing marks. Yeah. So even in that literal plane, people are constantly resisting the stigma that is pressed upon them. And the other example you just mentioned there, Alison, was of Christians who started to tattoo themselves uh, with a sign of a fish or another sign that denoted that they um, were Christians in a context where Christian Christianity was outlawed or, or you would be persecuted. And, and the ways in which that was a more kind of secretive or um, way to have a symbol to write upon yourself uh, in a resistant way. So tattooing isn't straightforward. And in the book, I look a bit at the history of tattooing to look at how that might be a practice, an anti-stigma practice, um, a way to reclaim agency in the context um, of oppression. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, resistance. I guess my point is that we need to understand stigma is a form of power 
um, to get to the resistance and the kind of version of stigma, I think, that kind of predominates a little bit within social psychology and the social sciences that we tend to use or we point to and say, look, there's stigma at work can sometimes be um, forget questions of power and forget questions of struggle and, and forget questions uh, also to some extent of agency and forgetting power. So emphasising stigma as power and thinking about all those different mechanisms of stigma production, looking up and looking back, is to get us to a place precisely where we can think about resistance practices. There are a few other questions that actually invite you to link this book to your previous one and your work on social objection. And specifically, Jason's asked whether, you know, in terms of this theme of, uh, you know, what we can do, how you respond, whether the way you've discussed riots, for example, in previous work is something that might be linked to this thinking about how we actually um, counter those structures that are reproducing inequalities and, and particular forms of stigma. So resistance is the theme here, I can see. Um, so I suppose it's a similar um, type of book in that I take a kind of concepts and revolting subjects that Jason's referring to. I took the concept of abjection and I tried to think about that concept more sociologically. Um, I kind of re-termed it social abjection in my work to think about how abjection works at the level of society, how people are made abject and how that abjection, being made abject, can, can become a way or a site of resisting, of, of resisting um, those forces that are expelling you, that are making you into a revolting subject, as I call them. So there's, the, there's that double meaning of the term revolt that I play on, that the people who are made revolting also revolt against that. Um, so how does that resistance work? I guess you're asking um, in relationship to stigma. And I think I've already touched a little bit on that, but I suppose understanding it's a much bigger book, uh, literally bigger, it's longer, but it's much more vast in terms of its historical scope and it's also its geo ge geographical scope. It's a book that takes us around the world and is much more concerned. Revolt and Subjects is very much focused on Britain and this book begins in Britain, it begins in austerity Britain, but it takes us on a historical journey that takes us to colonial India, uh, that takes us to to fascist era Europe in, in the mid 20th century, that takes us to the US, it takes us in, to lots of different places in order to think about how those histories unfurl uh, in relationship to the stigmatization today. So I think one of the things around this book and resistance was what I learned was that we need a much more historical understanding of power um, to resist. <clears throat> so one of the things that kind of prompted this book a little bit was a concern with the ways in which terms like neoliberalism, which is a perfectly useful term in some contexts, can kind of occlude uh, history in a way in which what we actually see is lots of continuities and repetitions. So what, one thing I was really keen to do was disturb um, the sense of the new by kind of rooting this, the concept of, his, of stigma and resistance to stigma within, within histories much more. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I guess um, to resist now, we have to look at how people have resisted in the past and learn from that would be one of the things I would want to say in response to that question. Great. Thanks, Imogen. Um, we don't have very much time left, but there's one question here that um, quite a lot of people have liked that's um, really inviting you to further draw out um, 
the kind of, of forms of stigma that are being used to pathologize groups that are hyper visible today. And the examples given um, to uh, are of the working class or asylum seekers. Um, there was another question uh, thinking specifically about migrants, refugees, um, those who have a sort of illegal status. Um, so I'm not sure if there's anything that you'd be interested to draw yeah. further in terms of how you address some of those themes in, in this book, I know. Yeah, so so the talk's been focused on this kind of on particular line today, but what it, it what isn't in it, what is a little bit more in this GIF actually is a clue. It's thinking about things like the media industries and the relationship between corporate media and political forms of government today. So one of I think, and also digital forms of surveillance um, and media and, and surveillance capitalism. So I think one of the, and I, I, I do explore this in the book uh, and it's there at various points, but I think perhaps an additional piece of work would be to, to take that into thinking about the kind of digital surveillance cultures, but also the kind of hyper, um, the collusion and the hyper representation of particular groups and particular figures um, so there is a chapter in the book that focuses on the refugee crisis in, in Europe that thinks about stigmas, borders and racism. Uh, and there's an, um, a chapter in the book about austerity that thinks about class and poverty in relationship to Britain and the austerity state. So I do cover some of that work there and think about how those machines, those stigma machines are assembled um, from different parts and different contexts. But I think the main thing I'd want to say is that we need to, to attach this idea of stigma as a kind of form of power that's impressed upon people to our understanding of the kind of apparatus of um, media culture. And that media culture has got, isn't, there are new aspects to it in the terms of the digital that we, the algorithm um, that we're seeing today, and there's lots of great writing that I haven't got time to talk about around kind of algorithmic politics that we could think of as another form actually of stigma politics very often. That's great. And that, um, you know, we are running out of time here. Otherwise, I think it would be really interesting to hear you speak even more about that in terms of how um, understanding the body um, and stigma and marking on the body actually relates to all these other things, including algorithms, including passports with particular types of visas, including these things that now are, are, are parts of us that are being worked upon and that these marking outs are in relation to, even if they are not, you know, quite as much our body as our skin in the way that that tattooing was. But um, I think we're probably going to have to end it here. There are so many other interesting um, questions. I think one thing that is worth just um, repeating, Sam has made a really important point here that um, just because stigma might fail to cause shame, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a failure to stigmatize because that person is still part of a stigmatized group um, with a wider re lived reality. I think that is a really important point that a lot of people have recognized and that I can see Imogen nodding along here as well. Um, so thank you so much Imogen for joining us today um, and sharing your thoughts and thank you so much to everybody who has been a part of the seminar today. Um, I wish we had more time to get uh, continue this conversation, but there's lots of ways you can do that. Uh, please do uh, follow Imogen on Twitter. She has a lot of really interesting pardon me, really interesting related um, material she's been putting out, particularly in relation to how this work co connects to her work on decolonizing, using different types of theorists um, and thinking about our location here in Lancaster in relation to that. So please do get in touch and thank you so much for joining us today.